that. So, if we could start maybe by having you say your name and spell your last name for us. Okay. You ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm a Leonard Gustafson. Last name is spelled G U S T A F S O N. All right. And my name is Robert Bauman, and today's date is October 16th, as we've clarified, <laughs> 2013. Uh, and we're conducting this interview on the campus of Washington State University Tri-Cities. So uh, let's start, if we could, by uh, having you tell us uh, when you came to Hanford, what brought you here, how you heard about the place. Okay. Why you came here. Well, we can do that in almost any direction. I, uh, I knew about the place uh, for a couple of reasons, but uh, the main reason was that some of my uh, fellow chemical engineers from Montana State University had come over a year or two earlier. And so when I finished up at Bozeman uh, and started looking for a job, it seemed like I uh, might take at least a temporary uh, assignment at uh, this wartime <laughs> installation until I found a real job. So uh, I arrived on October 15th of 1950. It's been a little while ago, isn't it? 63 years. Almost your anniversary, yeah. And uh, went through, I guess, the normal <laughs> procedures, found out about uh, what was going on in the plant and security and how to a little bit about how to deal with, uh, you know, radioactive materials. And then I was uh, assigned to my first tasks. Um, I was what they called a supervisor in training and went into the operations uh, part of the chemical processing department. And uh, my first uh, building that I went to was tea plant the tea plant, uh, bismuth phosphate separation plant. And about all I did there was uh, learned how to uh, detect can contamination and clean it up. I always tell the story that uh, the operators really loved having these young supervisors and training come in because they could hand them a bucket of acetone or something like that and a bundle of rags and a cutie pie, which was our instrument for detecting radiation, and send us out to scrub the deck. <laughs> in the separation plants, and this is common after uh, the crane operator removes the blocks from the cells, um, he always leaves a little bit of contamination on the deck. So that's a rather regular job. So I learned how to handle uh, the cutie pie and how to go through the, how to dress, you know, put us in our white coveralls and <laughs> learn how to go through what we called at that time the SWP, special work permits. It's been called many different things. Anyhow, that started me out uh, after, I believe it was about two months in tea plant, I was assigned to the startup of the radox operation. Now the radox was the uh, first of the solvent extraction plants. And um, so it uh, was essentially near completion there at the end of 1950, the beginning of 51. Um, so we went through the uh, final inspection processes and start up and then I was assigned to one of the four operating shifts that operated that building. Uh, this was, <laughs> you know, extremely interesting. It was like a great big pilot plant uh, or laboratory. Uh, and we chemical engineers uh, essentially had the responsibility for operating. And, uh, 
we we moved into that plant without having much time for a lot of training and procedural preparation. So in order to at least establish some kind of order beyond uh, simple procedures, uh, the operation was strictly conducted by the, en by the engineers, by the uh, supervisors. Each, each shift had uh, eight shift supervisors and two senior supervisors. And initially, all the operation was uh, conducted by the supervisors. The operators were just sort of learning at that stage. After oh, you know, a year or so, the operators were ready to run the plant. We didn't need so many supervisors. So in late 53, I uh, went out on a, another rather interesting assignment. Uh, engineering at that time was responsible for inspection. We didn't have anything like quality assurance organizations. So uh, the engineering inspectors took care of uh, the required inspection of any materials or equipment that we were ordering from Hanford. I was assigned mostly out in the uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky area, New York. <laughs> Spent a little over a year. It was a very active thing. Frequently, uh, I'd turn in an expense account, account for seven different locations in a week. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, is this about the yeah, this is where you want to go? I, you know, I can cut things pretty short if you'd like. <laughs> great. Keep going. <laughs> uh, so, anyhow, that uh, you know, we got into some fabulous. Uh, <laughs> big plants and all this sort of thing and uh, learned a little more about, uh, you know, how to build things because uh, some of the time we were actually not only assigned for the final inspections, but we went right through all the, the manufacturing stages. And so that, uh, I guess the, I returned then to Richland in uh, the beginning of 55. And by that time, the Purex plant was um, nearing completion. That was the second of the big solvent extraction plants. And so I was assigned, you know, for the startup and so on of that plant. And, uh, my first, well, my final assignment there was basically a, I was the operating supervisor for C shift. <laughs> Uh, C shift was one of the four shifts that was responsible for operating the plant. By that time, the operators were pretty well trained, so I had about 18 or 19 operators and two chief operators. And uh, there was one uh, technical man also assigned to the shift. But the, the <laughs> I'd have to look upon that assignment as probably the most responsible job I ever had starting up and running that plant, the operating group was basically re responsible for the main process. And uh, the shift crews had the responsibility to run it. You know, unless there was some real serious problem or question, we had to find the answers and go ahead and do it. So, <clears throat> there were many experiences there, but I was after a couple of years, uh, well, I'd been married in the process there at the end of 55, and um, my wife was a teacher, and, and it was getting to the point where uh, shift work was not the most <laughs> desirable. We'd touch base occasionally, you know. So I moved into a, one of the uh, engineering groups, in, again, in the separations department process design and development. Uh, uh, Johnny Fecht, just one who's still around, I think, uh, managed that group mm -hmm. and a good friend. And so I spent a uh, couple years in that work. We were basically responsible for <laughs> new 
uh, activities or problem activities that the engineering group was supposed to take care of to uh, support the operations. And so after uh, you know, two, three years there, I thought it was about time to see some more of the plant. So I moved on down to the 300 area and worked with the uh, plutonium recycle test reactor. So I spent a couple, three years there. So that had to be about 60, 61, somewhere in there. Didn't get the exact dates. And, uh, so I went through the startup and operation of the plutonium recycle test reactor. Now this was not associated with, uh, you know, plutonium production. This was uh, really in support of the oncoming uh, pro nuclear industry for power production, for electrical production. And uh, the reason for the PRTR was to demonstrate that plutonium could be used as well as uranium-235 as the fissile fuel for commercial reactors. And it was a successful project, and at that time, uh, projects uh, were completed on time and uh, usually under budget. And so um, it was a success as far as I'm concerned. After that plant was operating and they didn't have much need for me around anymore, I moved on out to the 100 areas and uh, this good friend of mine, Gene Astley, asked me one day what I was doing and I said, well, I guess I'm about ready to do something else. And so he says, well, come on out and work for me for a while. So I went out to the 100 areas. It was, must have been 64 or 5. And uh, worked largely with the uh, water plant type uh, problems and questions that were going on. Now we're getting into the area where, you know, we're getting about ready to, <laughs> the Cold War was sort of winding up so production wasn't <laughs> number one priority anymore. And so there were a lot of questions about, you know, what was the future of Hanford and so on at that time. So um, after working a couple, three years out there, I guess not quite, uh, I moved on down to the fuels department and um, worked uh, with Charlie Mathis, the manager of fuels production at that time. Uh, this must have been about 65. And my main activity there was mostly planning for what are we going to do with the fuels manufacturing <laughs> plants uh, in the future. And so very, very interesting, and uh, we worked along with uh, Roy Nielsen had a group that was uh, overall Hanford planning at that time. And uh, so after a couple of years there in the fuels department, I actually moved into Roy's group. And uh, so this had to be 67, 66, 67, maybe 66. Not real sure. From uh, with that assignment, one of the things that was done at that time, the AEC, you know, countrywide, was uh, studying and planning for what to do with the nuclear facilities and how they were going to support uh, commercial electrical power generation. So they had a group down at Oak Ridge. It was called the AEC Combined Operational Planning Group. And Hanford, as well as most of the sites, were responsible for providing uh, two or three <laughs> representatives. So I spent uh, about a year and a half down there. I was in basically 68. And uh, of course that was quite fascinating because we were looking at the overall 
AEC complex and uh, what was the future for nuclear power essentially. I, what, what are the, one of the things I got involved with were the nuclear power forecasts and um, I spent a lot of time at headquarters. Uh, Frank Baranowski was the uh, head of the production division, essentially responsible for Hanford, Savannah River, Oak Ridge, you know, all of the main production facilities. Spent some time with him <laughs> every now and then. Very fine fellow. Uh, and so after a year and a half or so there, I felt it was about time to get back home. And we had actually moved the family there, so we'd moved completely, had sold our house and rented in Oak Ridge. So we came back to Richland at the, uh, I guess the end of 69. Uh, and uh, the big activity, or one of the big activities at that time was the uh, FFTF. So uh, I again went with the FFTF project, so I changed, I had been with Douglas United Nuclear, so at that time I went to Battelle, who was responsible for the early FFTF. Bit. And, uh, my good friends Astley and Condota, who were the manager and engineering manager, uh, they uh, did not stay with the project, but we Indians sort of stayed with it. <laughs> that was when the uh, AEC, the Milt Shaw years, decided that uh, Battelle was not adequately competent to take on a project like that. They needed somebody with more, I guess, manufacturing and uh, big project experience. So Westinghouse had been assigned to take over that responsibility by the AEC. So I then became a Westinghouse employee. Spent uh, most of the next, I guess, 10 years with the FFTF project till it was uh, complete and operating. By that time, we're getting up to what 1980 range. <laughs> so uh, those were interesting times. Uh, we, uh, we had a lot of particularly early conflict. The uh, assigning Westinghouse to take over the project didn't really satisfy what Milt Shaw was after. And we had a rather severe conflict. And uh, Milt Shaw was finally ousted. And I still don't know for sure who was the most influential in getting that because uh, the project was floundering. And we, um, we moved the AEC representatives from Washington, D.C., the most, most closely associated, came to Hanford and, and became the uh, essentially the FFTF project office on site. Uh, most of the closely associated Westinghouse staff who'd been in Pittsburgh <laughs> moved to Hanford. And uh, we were able to work over a local table rather than on the phone and at crazy meetings. And um, the FFTF came together quite well. And uh, I think it was a very successful project. Perhaps we didn't finish it under budget, uh, but uh, we did well after it was reorganized. It started up and ran very successfully. Uh, too bad that we couldn't find better use for the plant. The, uh, of course, the liquid metal fast breeder program essentially fizzled. <laughs> so um, let's see, from, from that, uh, well, I'm getting pretty well along and need something uh, 
maybe a little different. So I uh, got into a rather, again, uh, what I regard as an interesting assignment. Uh, Westinghouse, they're somewhere close to that period, 1978, 1979, 80, had been assigned to run a nuclear quality assurance program office. And although Westinghouse Hanford was running that office, we were really part of the AEC, or what became DOE. And uh, the work we did the next few years was largely to try and add something, coordinate the quality assurance programs around all of the sites. Lots of travel involved, lots of lecturing, lots of QA audits. <laughs> I ran so many QA audits that <laughs> I can't remember. And like I tell people, I found it, that I got into more parts of Savannah River than most of the people who worked there. I think I was involved in at least 30 audits there over the years. Um, this evolved into, you know, that office, let's see, it, it, it finally closed down in either six, or um, what, 87 perhaps. And so I came back to a more uh, conventional uh, Hanford type quality assurance and did that until uh, I retired in uh, 1990. Uh, the one of the last projects that I was on there was an SP100. We were going to do a space reactor, and uh, SP100 was an interesting project, but uh, it also never came to pass. Amazing, ended back in the PRTR building <laughs> because we were going to use, we cleaned out some of the cells in the PRTR building and we're going to put in a big vacuum tank there so we could simulate space for running this space reactor. 